So I'm going to, this is a, a, the cover of my book, by the way, which is also the title of my talk, uh, 100 Plus, How the Coming Age of Longevity Will Change Everything from Careers and Relationships to Family and Faith. And I'm going to try to go over as many of those things in the allotted time that I have. Uh, let's just start the clock here. So I'm going to start my presentation with a personal story. This is a photo of my grandfather, Ralph Arison, who just celebrated his 100th birthday last week um, in Hawaii. Uh, a bunch of our family members were there. It was great. Grandpa was born in 1913, the same year that vitamin A and vitamin D were discovered. It wouldn't be until 15 years later that vitamin C was isolated. And it wouldn't be until 40 years later that the polio vaccine was invented. In fact, the year he was born, indoor, indoor plumbing and car travel was just a luxury, not something that everybody had. So Grandpa's seen a lot of technological change in his time. Everybody in my family wants to be like Grandpa. He seems to do everything right. He exercises, he eats well, he travels all over the place. In mid recent years, he's been to Venezuela and France and Lake Tahoe, and then, of course, Hawaii for his birthday. And only three years ago, when he was 97, uh, he called me and informed me that he was in training to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. <laughs> and he was serious. This was not a joke. <laughs> I was a little taken aback, as I'm sure you are, uh, because that's a tough climb even for somebody uh, who's much younger and in good shape. Fortunately, his doctor talked him out of it, and he did not attempt Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> Uh, you know, my, my grandfather's very ambitious, I will give him that, but he is not rare. Oh, let's see if this is going to work here. So centenarians, which are people who are 100 years and older, are the fastest growing part of our population in the United States and all around the world. And you can see from this data from the U.S. Census Bureau um, that just in a short period of time from 1980 to 2010, the numbers of centenarians in the U.S. grew from 32,000 to 53,000. By 2050, it's projected that there'll be 600,000 centenarians in the US. And that's with today's technology, which, for, in my opinion, is not nearly as good as it's going to be. So you know, when we hit 2050, uh, there may be 600,000 centenarians. There may be more. And I think they'll be healthy, and perhaps even healthier than my grandfather is right now. And I'll tell you why in a second. But first, let's go through some history. So this is, this is one of humanity's greatest, greatest accomplishments. Um, you can see this is life expectancy over time, starting in the way back in the Cro-Magnon era. Uh, humans could only expect to live 18 years. By the time of the European Renaissance, they could expect to live around 30 years. By the time of 1850s America, they could expect to live 43 years. And today, it's around 80 years. So that's a pretty huge gain. And I like the fact that it's going up even more uh, closer to where we are. And so some people will look at this and say, oh, well, this chart is very misleading because you know, really one of the ways that we increase life expectancy over time is you know, we weren't eat being eaten by lions on the savanna anymore. And I mean, there are all these you know, things that we did to make ourselves, to make humans live longer. Uh, better nutrition, better sanitation. And yes, all of that is true. Indoor plumbing was fantastic. But in the second half of the 20th century, the reason why this line continues to go up is because of progress we've made tackling the things that kill us at the end of life, like heart disease and cancer. And that research continues, and it's about to get better. The reason is that biology has become an engineering project. So I got really interested in this topic around 2003, uh, when I was, you know, I was hanging out in Silicon Valley, that's where I live, surrounded by computer scientists. And I noticed that a bunch of my computer scientist friends had a whole bunch of intro to biology books on their desks. Now that's kind of weird. And so I asked one of them one day, what, what's up with all this intro to biology reading? And he said to me, very earnestly, oh, well, you know, the next frontier of hacking is the human code. He's like, and I want to hurry up and you know, get a jump on it before everyone else. And that just blew me away. You know, today he's hacking computers. Tomorrow he expects to be hacking the human genome. And that's very, very exciting. 
And so some of you probably know that the first draft of the human genome was completed in the year 2000. It was only a draft, research kept going, and it was very, very expensive when it was first done, which is why we haven't seen more up until this point, but it's gotten cheaper. And it's because computing power is getting better and better all the time. And because of that, it's cheaper and cheaper to sequence somebody's genome. And once it becomes really cheap, then researchers will be able to do a lot more with it. You know, when the, when the human genome was first sequenced, it cost $3.6 billion. Today, you can get a human genome sequenced for about 15000 So, I mean, that's, that's a, pretty big, a pretty big jump. And it's going to get cheaper and cheaper all the time. So, how do you hack a genome? One of the ways to hack a genome is through something called gene therapy. It's been used already to cure things like hereditary blindness, um, some childhood diseases, and so it's been relatively successful so far. Uh, in the lab, scientists are using hacking genomes or gene therapy to allow animals to live much, much longer lives. So for instance, Cynthia, Dr. Cynthia Kenyon at UCSF in San Francisco has tweaked the genomes of small worms called C. elegans, and making a few tweaks to their insulin pathways, she's allowed those worms to live six times longer than they would normally live. But it's not just six times longer. It's six times longer healthier. They're not older and decrepit longer. They're older and younger longer, which is proof that she has slowed down aging. She and all her colleagues and all the other scientists who are doing work in this field now say that aging is plastic. It's something that actually can be messed with. You can slow it down. And that's really a revelation because for the longest time, everyone thought that aging was set in stone and there was nothing you could do about it. But that's not true any longer. And so that's very exciting. Humans have the same pathways that the worms, uh, that got manipulated for the worms. Now, of course, it's not going to be tomorrow or any time in the near, near future that we're hacking human genomes to allow humans to live six times longer, potentially, than they might have lived otherwise. Uh, so what else is out there that's very exciting in the, in the scientific world that we might be able to see much sooner? There's something called tissue engineering. Has anyone here heard of tissue engineering? It's basically the ability to grow brand new human organs in the lab out of somebody's own stem cells. So one of my favorite examples um, is a, a, of a man who lived in Iceland who, you know, 36 years old, father of two children, he was working on a geology degree and was diagnosed with cancer of his trachea, his windpipe. And they tried everything, all the traditional uh, techniques to, to fight the cancer, it wasn't working. And doctors said to him, look, you know what? You have a choice. You're probably either gonna die or we can try to build you a new windpipe. What do you wanna do? <laughs> and he's like, well, that's not much of a choice. Let's go for the new windpipe. And so doctors took a 3D scan of his, what his windpipe looks like. So they knew the dimensions they needed to get. They created a scaffold or a, a model out of nanomaterials, took some of his own stem cells and seeded the model with his stem cells, incubated it in the lab for two days, and then did surgery. Took out the cancerous windpipe, put in the new one, and he was cancer free. And he was completely cured. So I mean, that to me, that's just such a wow story, right? Um, tracheas have been grown in the lab, bladders have been grown in the lab, or I'm, I'm sorry, for humans, tracheas and, and bladders have been grown for humans, real humans, and implanted in real people. Uh, in fact, the first bladder was made for a child in 1999, and researchers didn't disclose it until 2006, because they wanted to make sure it actually worked long term, and it did. Uh, in the lab, researchers are making a whole bunch of other organs, everything you can think of almost, except for the brain. Uh, they're trying to create, um, and good progress has been made on lungs and heart. In fact, Dr. Doris Taylor, who works at the Texas Heart Institute, uh, said just recently that she plans in probably two years to start human trials on heart parts, probably. It won't start with a whole heart, but maybe heart parts. And that's a really big deal, because of course, heart disease is the number one killer in this country. So those are some of the super exciting things happening in medicine, you know, of course, there's personalized medicine, and creating pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals for your genome type, and all of that kind of stuff. We could probably spend all day talking about. Um, but what I wanted to do was go even further and say, okay, 
So this is what's happening. Maybe we can you know, replace parts on a human like we replace parts on a car so we can allow people to live much longer and healthier lives. Not just longer, but healthier. So what? Then what? How does that change the world? And so that's what the next part of this presentation <coughs> is about. So what I did is I went back in time and I said, OK, well, you saw before that we roughly doubled life expectancy from 43 to 80 today. What happened in that period of time? in society as a whole. And it turns out that a lot of scholars have actually done work on this, especially in the field of economics. And as we live longer and healthier lives, we become wealthier. And the reason for that is because health begets wealth. You can't work if you're sick. If you're healthy, you can work and be productive and contribute to society and the economy grows. So that's essentially why wealth grows when people are healthier. And you know, there's some numbers up here. I won't read the whole thing. But just the bottom line here, from 1970 to 2000, the gains in life expectancy in the US, which were just five years, added 3.2 trillion per year to national wealth. Those are huge numbers. This is a very, very big deal. And so you can imagine if you have you know, a country with a five-year life advantage over another one, right? and studies have been done on this, how much more the economy would grow. It would be 0.5%. But what if it was a 10-year advantage? What if a 20-year advantage? You can imagine how this could really add up. So this is a very, very big deal, not only um, you know, for life, but also for international competitiveness. Education. So what happened uh, to education the last time we lived longer and healthier lives? Well, more people went to school. This is uh, just the high school numbers. Um, but the reason why there's an incentive to get more education when you live a longer period of time is because you have more time to use that education you get more of a bang out of your initial investment. So you have more of an incentive to actually get educated when you know that you're going to have a longer, healthier life. Plus, if you're around longer, you have time to do more stuff. Um, you know, today, if you wanted to be a doctor and a lawyer, that's pretty hard to do because it's a big investment in education. But tomorrow, you know, when, if you could live to be 150 in a relatively healthy state, maybe you could do both. And that would be pretty exciting. Family. So uh, people have been getting married later and later. Uh, today, the age at first marriage is 28 years for men and 26 years for women, up from 23 and 20 in 1950. That, uh, you know, I've had a few people say to me, you know, that, that doesn't look like it's jumped that much. It's weird that it hasn't jumped more because life expectancy has jumped so much. Uh, yes, and then I've also got this part about <laughs> sunset clauses on marriage. We, if you, Imagine you get married, you can live to be 150 years old. That's a long time, right? Until death do you part. <laughs> so some, some people are starting it to talk about the idea of a sunset clause on marriages. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> um, but it's funny that these numbers haven't gone up more. And I think the reason for that is uh, because of fertility constraints. And that is today still, a woman's fertility significantly begins to decline in around 35 years. And you know, despite advances that have been made in IVF and all that kind of stuff, it's still pretty tough. Um, although there's a lot going on in that area. And I actually think that the technology um, you know, for storing a woman's own biological eggs is advancing so quickly that it won't be long, actually, until we see the numbers really jump in terms of first time moms. You can see here uh, the proportion of first births to women aged 35 years and older increased by nearly eightfold from seven, 1970 to 2006. It's quite the jump. It's going to jump even more um, as people get married later and take time for education. So that brings us to population. What happens to population in a world where people don't die quite as quickly? This was actually one of the things I was super concerned about when I first started doing research in this area. Um, as you can see from this chart, population growth rates are tanking. And the UN actually estimates by the year 2050, the world population won't be replacing itself. It'll be below, fertility rates will be below 2.1, which is what you need to replace yourself. Um, but the reason to, that is not quite as concerning um, is when, you know, when I talk to scholars who study this area, they said, look, pop, heavy population growth comes from births, not from fewer deaths. And the reason for that is that births are exponential. When you have children, you have multiple children, one, two, three, four, and it's exponential, and so population can really grow. Versus when one person doesn't die, it's just one person. 
So population growth is not driven by fewer deaths, it's driven by more births. So that's really where you need to look as a fertility end, not, not the fewer death uh, end. So that's, that's interesting. It means the population probably won't skyrocket quite as much as you might think um, at first glance when you, th when you think about longevity. And then there's the question of equality. So right now, as you can see, uh, here's the top 10 countries, life expectancy. Monaco's at the top with a life expectancy of around 90 years, which is pretty good. And then we have the bottom 10 countries. Angola's down there at 38 years. That's a divide of roughly 50 years. That's almost an entire lifetime. It's really big. So what happens when wealthy countries get access to regenerative medicine and other health technologies first? And they will, because that's what happens there's going to be an even greater divide. And the question then is, well, how long will it take for new technologies, new regenerative medicine technologies, to move from the wealthy countries to the less wealthy countries? And the answer to that is unclear. But if you take the premise that biology is quickly becoming an information technology, that we're turning pieces in the real world into bits, right? Genomics is moving really, really fast because it's using computing power to sequence genomes. If, if you look at that and you say, well, like some part of biology is actually in the information technology space, then you can say, well, maybe it's part of a trend that we can see here. And you can see that it took 46 years for a quarter of the US population to get electricity. It took 35 years for, the t for that amount to get the telephone, 16 years for the personal computer, 13 years for the cell phone, and seven years for internet access. So it's going, the amount of time it takes for technology to distribute throughout society is shrinking. And so we can hope that these new health technologies are going to be part of this trajectory and not part of a more traditional trajectory that we've seen uh, in the biological sciences. So I'm going to end my talk with, this to me is the, the most important part of the talk. And that is, we cannot afford to be complacent. Yes, there are a lot of technologies in the lab and being created that are going to help human beings live longer and healthier lives. And yes, they will exist, no matter what we do. But when they get distributed is the question. <laughs> and I don't want to be part of the last generation to only live to 80 years old. Right? The next generation gets to live to 150 years healthy, and I don't. I don't want to be in that generation. So it's very, very important that everybody who can actually works on this problem of how do we slow down aging? How do we repair human beings? How do we get a better understanding of how the human body works so that we can live longer and healthier lives? And if we don't actually make an effort, then it won't happen fast enough for us. It'll probably happen for other people. But that's not good enough. <laughs> we want it to happen for us. And so this is a call for a movement for people who care about this issue to get involved, to say, look, what can I do to have an impact uh, on, on human health span? You know, if you're a scientist, you can do work in this area, of course. But if you're a writer, a journalist, you can write about this area and increase awareness. If you're a philanthropist, you can give money to this area. If you're an artist, you can create <coughs> projects that uh, illustrate that area. So I mean, there's so many different things that all sorts of people can do and actually need to do in order to make this more of a movement than it is today. So with that, I will, uh, I will end. Thank you.